Hello, everyone. Welcome to the C.S. Lewis Foundation's webinar series. We're delighted to welcome you today for our conversation with Yu Cheng Bai, Emerging from the Underground, Chinese Christians and a Search for a Mature Faith. This is the final webinar of our third series, which we began back in May of 2020. And if you'd like to go back and watch some of our old previous material, you can access that on our YouTube channel, as well as some of our in-person lectures from previous conferences. We'd like to thank our friend Matthew Clark for the song which that was playing as you arrived this evening, Pilgrims on the Way, written by Matthew Clark and arranged and performed by Matthew and the Sweet Airs. I'm Amber Saladin. I'm the Arts and Ministry Director for the C.S. Lewis Foundation. This might be your first time joining us and you are very welcome this evening. If you haven't already done so, feel free to say hello in the chat and tell us from where in the world you're joining today. Allow me a moment to introduce you to the C.S. Lewis Foundation. Inspired by the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis, we encourage and equip Christians to live out their faith within the world of ideas and the arts. The goal is for our programs to produce spiritually equipped and culturally literate Christians who are transformative in whatever area they may be called to serve. Our webinar series partners with our in-person events to provide community and engage lifelong learning year round. So if you'd like to stay on after the webinar to have a discussion group with some other folks, please do. If you haven't already got the link for that, send a direct message to Stephen Elmore and he'll send the link when this webinar is over. These discussion groups have provided a much needed way to process and to think through some of the things that we learn in the webinars, much like the coffee break does when we are together in person. And speaking of in-person events, the C.S. Lewis Foundation President uh, Stephen Elmore will come on a little bit later to tell you what we have planned uh, for the um, upcoming future. So we're so glad that you can be with us tonight. Let's pray as we begin. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so grateful and so thankful that you work in every country of the world, that you desire every human to come to know you, to love you, to understand you, and to live with you in eternity. We're glad to know tonight, to learn more about what you're doing in China. We pray that you would use this conversation to quicken in our hearts a desire to talk about you wherever we may go, with our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, at the grocery store, and wherever we may find people who don't already know you. So Lord, awaken our hearts tonight by your Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to welcome our speaker, Yu Cheng Bai. Yu Cheng is a PhD candidate in religion at Duke University, writing a dissertation on modern Chinese and American church histories. Yu Cheng was born in China and raised as an atheist, but began to question this worldview during his teenage years. After a long period of seeking, he became a Christian during his undergraduate studies in the US and started to study Christianity academically. He has a master's in Chinese history from Columbia University and a master's in theological studies from Duke Divinity School. In his free time, he enjoys cooking and playing video games, and he'll be teaching a C.S. Lewis class at Duke University this fall. Welcome, Yu Cheng. Thank you. Thank you, Amber, for that very generous introduction. OK, cool. So uh, uh, thank you again for C.S. Lewis Foundation for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here. And uh, as uh, Amber introduced, I was born and raised an atheist. And during the early stage of my Christian journey, um, C.S. Lewis works helped me helped me to clear a lot of my doubts. And as I deepened in my faith, I found C.S. Lewis ever more and uh, ever richer and and ever more capable of providing inspiration for me. So it is truly an honor to be here to share my thoughts with the C.S. Lewis Foundation webinar. And uh, today my topic is emerging from the underground, the Chinese urban Christianity. Um, sociologists of, of religion in China, uh, in China had uh, commented that perhaps one of the most, uh, the fastest growing, the most exciting, and possibly um, the, the most significant in the long run change in recent Chinese history is the emergence of, of what we call urban elite Christians. 
they were emerging from the underground. Uh, but in order to understand why they emerged from the underground, we must first see why the religion went underground. Uh, I think uh, people with even just a passing knowledge of Chinese Christianity have probably heard the phrase underground church. Uh, that phrase was uh, often used to describe the reality of Chinese church, at least from 1950 onward, uh, very, of very often until now, the, uh, the kind of church that meets underground privately, away from the party state's prying eyes, and often in people's homes, in caves, and sometimes literally underground. Um, and that form of a practice in Christianity really began in 1950. As we all know, in 1949, the Communist Party took power in China. Uh, and uh, in the ensuing, in, ensuing years, they began to launch uh, various political campaigns to bring various spheres of society, including the church, under the party control. And in 1950, they launched the Free Self Patriotic Campaign. Uh, to bring, it, it, the aim is to bring Chinese church under the Free Self Patriotic Church Network, which is a state sanctioned church network. And uh, th that church network have to declare loyalty to the party state first, and only then loyalty to Jesus and to the uh, and to teachings of the Bible. And uh, of course, it was all done under the auspice of uh, excluding imperialist and foreign elements from the Chinese church. Um, but many Chinese Christians dissented from this uh, state-sanctioned church uh, for reasons of conscience, for of doctrine, and so on. Uh, but dissenting from the state sanctioned church meant that their Christian gathering became illegal. So they had to gather privately, secretly, hence the underground church was born. Um, of course, during the Cultural Revolution, which lasted from 1966 to 76, uh, all religious activities ceased uh, as a rampant, uh, a, a violent revolutionary fervor swept across China. Uh, but to people's surprise, when after Mao died in 1976 and his successor, Deng Xiaoping, uh, began uh, to change course and uh, opted for a limited um, uh, liberal reform, uh, to everyone's surprise, Christianity did not die in China. In fact, during the 30 years, Christianity had grown tremendously so that when the policy changed and the church once again could meet somewhat above ground, the church just sprung right back up. Um, and uh, uh, this new generation, uh, as we know, uh, in the end of 19, uh, 1970s, the college entry examination was restored. China reopened itself to a, a limited form of market economy. Uh, the college were reopened. Uh, the, uh, people no longer have to declare themselves a hardline Mao, Mao loyalist in order to receive education. Uh, and China once again opened to the outside world uh, economically and also intellectually. So there began to generate in China a new generation of uh, white collar urban dwellers, and many of them became Christians. Uh, and it is this generation, the more educated urban generation, that now makes up what we call urban elite Christians. Many of them emerged from the uh, traditional underground church, and they did not like what they, what they saw there. And uh, the 30 years of isolation, as we can see from 1970 to 19, uh, 1950 to 1978, the 30 years of uh, underground meeting of isolated uh, church had in, generated immense uh, faith in, in the believers, had saw the rise of many martyrs, many courageous dissenters from the state. But it had also meant that the Chinese church cultivated a kind of pietistic fundamentalism. What I mean is that because anything politic, political and anything public was squarely in the domain of the party state, the Chinese church began to uh, uh, adopt a kind of a teaching that to be truly Christian, one has to be entirely private, one has to be entirely pietistic, and one does not involve oneself in public or political affairs at all, because those affairs are unspiritual. Those spheres are unspiritual. So um, so that, that's how, and of course, that worked well for them in their underground setting. But as the urban elite generation of Christians um, go went into the cities uh, and went into even uh, jobs, uh, uh, high posting jobs in the government and in companies, they were not very satisfied with the private pietistic tradition of the Chinese indigenous underground church. Um, and so they began to find it, chart their own way forward. 
Now, why were these urban white collar dwellers uh, attracted to Christianity? Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a complicated issue, but the reason why they were attracted to Christianity was not entirely unlike uh, why uh, urban workers uh, during the rapidly industrializing years in America and England were attracted to uh, churches uh, with uh, urban ministries. In a, in a, a, a sociologist, Bridget Yangfenggang, once wrote an interesting article called Lost in the Market, Saved at McDonald's. Uh, which talks about it's a study of why Chinese white collar workers were attracted to Christianity, and you know Christianity provided for them as it did for urban workers um, years in the past a sense of family and a belonging when they were uprooted from the rural community, and a sense of a moral anchor in the cutthroat world of uh, corporation dealings, um, but. They, as I said, these generations were educated, they were politically ambitious, and at least back in the 1980s and 90s, they were optimistic about China's future. They believed that China was going to head into the direction of increasing liberalization, uh, and that's the course that China would go in the foreseeable future. So um, just, uh, just as they were becoming Christians, many social conditions during that time in the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s paved the way for the development of this uh, urban elite generation of Christians. The first uh, elements, what I call is more space for political liberalism. Uh, don't get too distracted by the label here. What I mean by liberal here uh, mainly just mean a, a generation of people who want to uh, curb state power, to restrain an overbearing state, and to carve out some space for the church and for civil society in China. And the state for a brief period indeed seemed to be genuinely interested in cultivating a more liberal uh, atmosphere. In 1982, the Chinese state released a landmark document called Document 19, uh, which was a, a document from the party state to instruct lower level party cadres uh, on how to deal with uh, Chinese religion. And uh, the main uh, gist of this document is that the policy towards religion now in China is no longer outright persecution, but that the lower level party cadres should seek to harness, or when I say hijack, the Christian energy and the Christian spirit for the modernization of China. So, uh, of course, the modernization is a very complex argument. You can pack a lot of things in it. And so all of a sudden, it became rather safe in China to talk, uh, to uh, build a case for Christianity if we can disguise this case as a case for modernization. Um, and, uh, th and there emerged uh, 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 then uh, many intellectuals who later formed the backbone of uh, what we call Sino theology today. Basically, they were thinkers who uh, w w wanted wanted to find a resource in Christianity to answer intellectual problems that they they think Chinese indigenous thoughts could not quite answer. Um, and, and that, again, is a huge group uh, in books have been written just about them. Uh, but to just name two example, one example, really, uh, Liu Xiaofeng and He Guanghu, they share uh, their intellectual journey uh, really centers on one quest, which is they believe that the Chinese traditional philosophy, Confucianism, Taoism, and so on, were not very were entirely imminent. They they do not have much space for the god from outside of this world, which makes them rather incapable of answering questions of ultimate meaning, uh, of what sacred truly means. And for them, uh, if we want to say certain things are sacred, uh, if we want to say life or private property and so on are sacred, we first of all need a worldview in which the very term secret, sacred makes sense. Uh, so in, they found such a worldview in Christianity, in, in a worldview in which a God from outside of the universe could break into our world. So that when we talk about things with ultimate meaning, there actually is something ultimate there to build that meaning upon. And in this sense, I think they, th their journey towards Christianity is not entirely unlike that of C.S. Lewis, especially earlier in his days. Uh, when, when they read uh, Western uh, thinkers, figures, um, Augustine, uh, uh, Schiller, uh, Kierkegaard, even Nietzsche, and so on, they began to realize that there is something there behind these thinkers that would not fully make sense unless there really is something more behind the world that we are seeing. 
So that uh, that launched a very fascinating intellectual journey that led many of them to appreciate in Christianity intellectually, and some of them eventually took a personal step to become Christians, uh, while some of them remained merely uh, intellectually friendly towards Christianity. Uh, but that's another development that paved the way for the rise of an educated generation of Christians in China. And of course, coupled with that, they <clears throat> they have existential dread and existential problems in that necessitated them to search for something more. Uh, earlier, I talked about the limited liberalization that the Chinese party state was implementing. Well, that liberalization had a hard ceiling. Um, as many of us know, um, in 1989, uh, the, the, what began as a spontaneous uh, morning uh, service in Tiananmen Square turned into a mass student demonstration uh, where people of all walks of life really wanted to peacefully petition the state to adopt further democratic uh, reform. But the state would have none of that. On June 4th, uh, the peaceful demonstrators were violently cleared away from the Tiananmen Square by armies and tanks. And the, the June 4th repression dealt a huge blow uh, in, in the heart of many Chinese intellectuals. They uh, realized that the, the, it is rather impossible in given the current arrangement of power to completely peacefully and gradually bring uh, a kind of a democratic reform in China. And if they want to continue to work towards that end, they have to search for some alternative foundation. And many of them found in Christianity. Uh, and, and especially in Calvinism. And uh, Liu Xiaobo, uh, the, the former uh, leading Chinese democratic activist and a Nobel Prize laureate, once said that he and many of his colleagues would find in Christianity and especially in uh, Reformed theology an ethereal foundation for political liberalism. And of course, the reason why they were attracted to Calvinism in particular uh, was also due to uh, the influx of American uh, missionaries uh, who, who were who overall leaned towards Calvinism. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is more complex. Uh, we, we, uh, suffice to say that uh, by the 1980s, uh, the missionaries sent from America were overwhelmingly of an evangelical and a fundamentalist leaning. And while that group are, are not usually the most theologically driven, the more theologically sophisticated among them tends to lean Calvinist. But uh, the main reason why many of these urban elite Christians found inspiration in Reformed theology and in Calvinism was because this theology, to their mind, could satisfy their top three uh, needs, which I have listed here as publicity, democratization, and doctrinal clarity. Um, now, the popularity of Calvinism, I, many observers have uh, have noticed. David Eichmann, for example, the, the one who wrote Jesus in Beijing, who once uh, very optimistically projected that uh, China could become a majority Christian nation in, in, in 2015 and so on, uh, he, he, he has once observed that um, uh, uh, he, he often runs into a young uh, Chinese Christians in bookstores who were looking for uh, uh, resources on uh, Calvinist teaching. And now, wh why? Uh, the, as for the top three needs, the first needs, what I would say, is publicity. Um, While well, many of them believe that the, as Christians, they were, they, they were not illegal, and uh, if they were not illegal, then why should they meet on the ground? And and here they too part of part of the driving forces forces here was the, the traditional mentality of Confucian literati uh, that uh, people who uh, have learned have advanced degrees in humanities should be custodians of society should be the the, the advisors to the state should be the the moral custodians of uh, of their cities of their neighborhoods so in this sense they want the kind of a public faith. And uh, also, they have realized that um, uh, it was also a very uh, pragmatic um, need as well. Because recall previously, during the underground years, the underground way of practicing Christianity is to keep the, uh, the church, while well, very small, very um, spread out, almost like a little satellite churches of 10, 12, 15 members each, so not to attract state attention. Um, but that kind of uh, view is is deemed no longer no longer viable in the in the new age of urban Christians. 
um, partly because uh, urban ministry is in, uh, ever more complex. So you cannot just have uh, a, a various small groups with the people having to preach every Sunday in each of those small groups. They need, we need a team dedicated to uh, the, the discipleship, a team dedicated to the, maintaining the church media, a team dedicated to, to publication. So that, requ that requires more concentrated effort from, uh, from, uh, from more people. And then, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, and and then um, there's also democratization. And here, uh, many of them believed that uh, the Calvinist uh, 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 theological foundation uh, somehow laid the ground for the mature constitutionalist system that we observe in America and 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 and, and Britain. Um, of course, there's a huge and complex debate on whether that actually is the case, but many of them were drawn to Calvinism as uh, as a missing piece in in the Chinese in the Chinese own endeavor to build a democratic and a constitutionalist society. And he, my dissertation is actually partly on that, so maybe we can talk more about that later. But suffice to say now that they do see in uh, the, uh, the Calvinist the concept of uh, belonging to a covenant of uh, needing to resist the state, especially during the English Puritan movements, of, uh, uh, of, of a mixed government, uh, of uh, the, um, the, 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 the idea of having a mixed monarchy uh, in the English in Presbyterian movements, they see in those ideas some early forms of a truly democratic society. And lastly, they need doctrinal clarity. Uh, during the 30 years of isolation, uh, many indigenous heresies sprung up from individuals who interpreted the Bible through apocalyptic lens, so that many of the urban elite Christians now need some sound systematic doctrine to curb indigenous uh, heretical teachings. And of course, uh, the reformed tradition is known for having doctrinal, uh, systematic doctrinal clarity. Um, and uh, but if so far the story seems a bit optimistic, of course, not, not everything is all sunshine and rainbows. And the, this generation of urban elite Christians face tremendous challenge. And the, uh, despite their political ambition, they have so far failed to generate the kind of a social movement that they had envisioned. Um, as as Lienzi, my advisor at Duke, often says, uh, religi re religiously inspired political change in China happens usually not through highly placed uh, religious humanists, but mainly through ap apocalyptic teaching combined with mass popular dissent. And many of these uh, churches face still face severe state persecution, especially after 2012 when Xi Jinping came to power and seeing that he has a uh, 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 accumulated even more power around himself now, state persecution is likely only going to ramp up in the years ahead. And last, and last but not least, many of these churches themselves had reports of scandals from within, from authoritarian leaders, from uh, n not knowing exactly uh, what part of, of the, uh, the Western theological tradition to inherit. I hear uh, a lot of reports about the church usually enjoying a more friendlier uh, relationship between male and female ministers. But once the church went to reform tradition, the, 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 uh, very often female ministers were excluded from the pulpit simply because they want to go in an American PCA style or a Westminster style. So there's a lot of historical baggage there as the Chinese church still face internal and external pressure. And as we are looking ahead, uh, this new generation of Chinese urban elite Christians contain much hope and they show us that this Christian religion indeed can be appealing to the upper crust of society and it can be a catalyst for um, incredible social change. But the path forward is perilous. And above all, in addition of surviving under state persecution, uh, we also need to think more clearly of uh, what is a mature public theology for Chinese church and a mature political theology, both for engaging with the state and for engaging within the church. And that, well, is the challenge facing the new generation of Chinese Christian today. And uh, let's see if our generation or my generation is up to the task. Uh, thank you. That is all I have to uh, share with you today. I hope uh, I hope that has has been helpful. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, for presenting on that topic. It's um, I mean I I'm uh, really glad to have you here since uh, you know um, you know those of you in the chat maybe would 
recognize since Yu Chung went to Duke and I went to Duke that we <laughs> know each other through the Duke program. Uh, we've been in the PhD there uh, together for many years. So I've been, uh, it's exciting for me to see you presenting on the research. I remember when you first started uh, working on on some of the dissertation topics that you discussed. So it's great to see it bear fruit. Um, if you have questions, um, please feel free to ask them in the, the Q&A, uh, put them in there. I'll go ahead and one thing I'm really interested in and kind of starting with is something we've often thought about um, in all of our C.S. Lewis Foundation webinars, we're always kind of interested in the personal component um, that the speakers have of like how their study, how their own faith is impacted by their study, how what's the intersection between like their uh, uh, personal, their career and also their personal uh, beliefs. And yours is so interesting because, um, you know, you're, you're studying this movement that doesn't have a lot of material known here by, you know, by uh, those of us probably in the chat. And so I'm curious what your relationship is to it and, and how uh, your own kind of perception and growth has been. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, indeed, we are we are uh, Duke colleagues and buddies. And uh, I, I, I still from and, uh, you know, as you know, Chris uh, has his degree in American Christianity. And uh, partly it was thanks to him that um, uh, <laughs> that I began to develop a more intense professional interest in American Christianity. And now I'm doing uh, Chinese and American Christianity. <laughs> yeah. So, um uh, yes, I am absolutely personally invested in this quest. In fact, um, the China, the writings of a Chinese elite urban Christians uh, is partly what got me interested in Christianity back in the day. Uh, when I was a high school student, um, I, I recall I had a very, a very courageous, when I think about it, a very courageous uh, 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 teacher who, uh, who taught us political thought. Um, in fact, he would often read from the school textbook, which is, you know, uh, in a very Marxist tradition. And then he would close the textbook and say to us, okay, my students disregard all of that as all lies. Uh, and, and then we would go on to talk about social issues that, that that's surrounding us. Uh, he, he was not a Christian. He was a traditional Confucianist, actually. Uh, so uh, and, and uh, back in the day, uh, Confucians were no less anti-Marxist than, than, than many uh, Christians. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the social issues we talk about back in the day was uh, forced the demolition of people's houses, which was happening in, in, in Nanjing, my hometown at, at the time. And uh, I recall very vividly one uh, one very disturbing piece of news where uh, a lady uh, refused to uh, give up her house uh, to be demolished. And then uh, the government, of course, just moved in with the bulldozers and demolished her house. And as a protest, she set herself on fire in front of the local government's building uh, as a form of a last protest. And uh, I, I recall thinking that was so wrong and uh, th that it, it is so wrong to sacrifice individual life on the altar of uh, economic development and, uh, and commercial housing and so on. But I struggled to find an intellectual foundation for why I should think so. Uh, after all, if, if we were entirely the product of chance, then it seems there is no ultimate foundation for the meaning of life for us. So uh, then I began to search, okay, maybe the uh, what worldview out there is capable of supporting the belief that human life is sacred beyond any of the GDPs and, and, and the state policies that, 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 that people can come up with. And that's, when I, and that's when I read some of the writings of the urban elite Christians who said that they found in the Western uh, foundation, of course, we know Christianity is, is not Western, it's global, but at the time they thought it was. They, they found in, in the Christian uh, tradition, a worldview to support the ultimate meaning, uh, the, the transcendent meaning of human life. And that to me was a huge inspiration um, and uh, probably launched my intellectual interest in Christianity, uh, which paved the way for my personal conversion several years later when I was an undergrad student in America. So uh, now that I'm studying this group of people who once inspired me, it's almost like uh, a, a semi-autobiographical journey. Yeah. yeah, also I have to ask, since you mentioned C.S. Lewis earlier, and this is a C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. Foundation event, I mean, how, how did... Um... How did the encounter with him factor into uh, your personal development? Oh, yeah. So, um, of course, um, I, I, 
once I be, uh, began to be a searcher and attended a Bible study, people recommended the Mirror Christianity to me, and uh, I, I, I I was reading Mirror Christianity. And uh, surprisingly, uh, it, it, it wasn't the, the his original um, uh, the the moral law argument that convinced me the most. Um, but rather, as I read more to the later part of Mirror Christianity, I began to realize that. Uh, this person, he has a different quality of life than the one I have. Uh, this uh, th th this author, C.S. Lewis, he sees life more deeply. He sees life more meaningfully than I do. And uh, it, I, I remember many of his uh, 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 analogies, right? Uh, like uh, we're all just little toy soldiers and there's a rumor going around that one day we, some of us are going to come back to fully alive. And the, it, it was that element that initially touched me the most, uh, because at, at that time I was studying engineering. Uh, uh, now I'm studying church history, but I was studying engineering. Um, uh, uh, my parents want a life of uh, a good school, good job, a good wife, good kids, and then good school, good job, good wife, and good kids, that, that kind of cycle. So part of me was wondering, okay, is that all there is to life? Uh, but then the C.S. Lewis uh, presented a different kind of life to me, and that, that made me wonder, okay, maybe there is a, a, a life in addition to this life, a higher life than this, and that really piqued my interest. So mm -hmm. uh, it was that thing that uh, that, that got me uh, hooked in, in the first place. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, because I was so pessimistic about uh, humans' ability to come to a moral understanding, uh, uh, I, I did not initially uh, give uh, very much credit for the moral law argument in mere Christianity until later when I come to study natural law and 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 and, and, and Catholic thoughts and so on. So I was once again struck by how broad C.S. Lewis is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's even though maybe the particular part of mere Christianity that stood out to you is is a little bit different. The, that is kind of a universalizing experience. Probably that almost everyone in this uh, seminar is probably going to have something similar to that, uh, mm -hmm. maybe in a different different uh, capacity, but mm -hmm. similar. Um, related to that, a question from our friend Michael Sutherland, um, mm -hmm. who was interested in connecting Lewis back to China. I mean, how do you see Lewis and his works playing a role in China today? I, I think we we had talked about this before, and it's. I think this is a really difficult question to know to know the answer to, but I'm curious about uh, what maybe your your conjecture or sort of hunch might be. Yes. So uh, unfortunately, I can only give uh, uh, hunches. Uh, uh, we, we, we will call them qualitative answers instead of quantitative answers, uh, <laughs> because we we don't have uh, data on that. Uh, but my my hunch is that. Uh, C.S. Uh, Lewis, at least from my personal encounter, is absolutely indispensable, in, uh, especially in, uh, it's in, in his way of uh, providing a good uh, children's literature in the form of Narnia and the Space Trilogy, uh, and in his way of illustrating Christianity so clearly, and in a way that does not narrow Christianity down to a particular denomination's take on it. So uh, the, the, those two things made C.S. Lewis immensely popular in Chinese uh, uh, Christian homeschooling circles. Uh, as, we, as we know, um, uh, as, the, uh, as the state is ramping up pressure to make sure that the, uh, the, that the public schools um, instill ever more militantly secular agenda. Uh, by the way, that, uh, that is what a secular school is teaching. Um, I am... I'm usually very cautious about uh, casting uh, public schools in an exclusively uh, uh, um, atheistic light, but in China, at least, that, that actually is true. Uh, we were taught in school that there is no God and there is no supernatural and there is no savior. Um, while understandably, increasingly increasing number of uh, Christian parents do not want to send their children to public schools and they want to homeschool. And in that homeschool movement, I think uh, C.S. Lewis, it, uh, I, I have run into many uh, Ch uh, Chinese Christians who grew up in homeschool uh, networks who say that uh, Narnia was uh, uh, was very often their first uh, tr truly interesting reading uh, from their homeschooling years. Yeah, and and of course, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, Mere Christianity, and uh, um, uh, other of his um, better known uh, theological uh, uh, the theological works are influencing uh, Chinese Christians. And I think uh, I have also seen in several areas where uh, Christians 
who converted to Christianity from a more narrower and one might say fundamentalist uh, route, we encounter C.S. Lewis because it's very safe to read C.S. Lewis. And mm -hmm. then they found in, they found in C.S. Lewis something bigger than their fundamentalist uprising, uh, upbringing. Uh, one uh, one very common, uh, well, maybe not very common, but at least I've heard it uh, several times now. Uh, one story is um, people coming from a certain background read C.S. Lewis' Mere Christianity, and then they realize, uh, wait, there are more ways to understanding soteriology than just penal substitution, than just Christ dying on the cross, because uh, as we call C.S. Lewis, had, is rather ambivalent, ambivalent about penal substitution. Uh, and his uh, favorite analogy is the sharing of life, the sharing uh, of um, <clears throat> the, uh, the 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 the, the, sh the idiomatum, the, uh, that that divine nature is shared with us. And that element, I think, often is missing uh, in Chinese Christianity. Um, not only because um, <clears throat> the, 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 of the what I call a narrower uh, theological influence that many Chinese Christians grow out of, but also uh, during uh, heavily persecuted years, it's hard to find room for uh, consistent uh, sacraments and, and, and ceremonies. And without that, it's also mm -hmm. a bit more difficult to always teach on what the sacraments mean, what, what does the Eucharist mean, and what is truly communicated there. So C.S. Lewis also has that broadening effect on many Chinese readers. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, you know, that same exact thing happened to me when I taught the C.S. Lewis class at Duke. Mm -hmm. There was sort of uh, a shock with some of the students that penal substitution was not something that was just self-evidently obvious, mm -hmm. and, and it was the only option in the, in the text. Um, that was something we talked about a bit in the class. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of questions popping up here. Um, so uh, Max Feiler, our, our, our friend, the, the great perambulator, was curious about how does the very sort of uh, colloquial sometimes British wit and humor translate? Like, how, how have you read it in translation? What, what's that like? Yeah, well, that's difficult. Uh, I will be very honest. Um, <clears throat> I the, the the best translation of uh, C.S. Lewis' work uh, currently done in China is done is done by a professor of literature at Nanjing University. And uh, um, uh, Max, as I'm sure you know, since you are the embodiment of the scientific spirit, it is difficult to to uh, to, uh, to, 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 to translate British humor uh, to, to to translate humor into another language. Uh, and uh, uh, for for some reason, when I read the Chinese translations of C.S. Lewis, the, they always they they does always sound more arcane than C.S. Lewis' original English actually is. Hmm. So yes, suffice to say that it, that 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 is a challenge, um, and uh, well, I think we might need someone who uh, is who, who is a master of both English and Chinese language to know the humors in each language to do some more translation works. Is that so, something? Is that something you might work on after you're done with your dissertation? <laughs> well, we shall see. I, 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 I thank, thank you for your for your uh, faith in, in my ling linguistic capacities. Um, we, we, yeah, we, we, we. Uh, I, I have, <laughs> no pressure. I have had, I have had a, a interest of uh, translating uh, mere Christianity uh, again in a more colloquial style, but mm. we, we will see. The, the, yeah, the, yeah, uh, one one problem at a time. <laughs> Um, well, so, you know, uh, to go back, maybe I, I want to touch, there's a couple questions, one from Lori and one from Lisa that I'd like to get to, but I wanted to touch before I lose the thread about, you mentioned um, the current situation being more difficult um, for some of, mm -hmm. you talked about this in the lecture and also in the recent question mm -hmm. about the current situation being more difficult ever since Xi Jinping um, mm -hmm. took power. And so, I mean, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? I mean, what, what has changed in the past 10 years that is significant and important for the Chinese church like right now in this decade because I that was I think something that probably a lot of people would be interested in hearing about yeah so uh for for one Xi Jinping turns out to be a much more uh, uh power hungry leader than uh, his predecessors uh so uh, w w w uh with the ever increasing uh uh increasing amount of power and increasing present increasingly overbearing state in various spheres of life the church is is not going to be immune to that uh, several things that has happened several uh, highlighted things that has happened in the past 10 years uh, one in 2014 the uh, in Wenzhou there was a decapitating church campaign where the state removed a lot of crosses from churches and uh, very often the church was just outright demolished 
and it's uh, it's unimaginable that that would happen in uh, in in, in Deng Xiaoping's time or even in Hu Jintao's time that Xi Jinping was able was able to just order the local authority to just bulldoze down churches. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, he is seeing the result of that and weigh whether they should do that uh, uh, nationwide. And then in 2019, uh, and uh, as I showed in the last of my slides, the outspoken pastor Wang Yi often uh, viewed as a, a typical example of the urban elite Chinese Christians uh, was arrested and sentenced to nine years in prison under the charge of inciting to rebel against the state. I mean, that's just a ridiculous charge. Anything can be thrown into that. Um, and, and although that law technically exists, very few uh, precedents exist where people actually were sentenced by that. Uh, but Xi Jinping was not, not afraid to, to use that kind of sentence. Of course, Wang Yi himself was personally also partly to blame. He became increasingly high profile and uh, 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 joined into the late 2010s despite the very good advice of many of his friends. So he might have sealed his own fate there, but still uh, state persecution definitely ramp up there. Uh, I know two other churches, uh, the Zion Church in Beijing, uh, uh, one of the largest church in, in Beijing uh, was uh, forcefully shut down just, uh, just two years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, and th there was a law can coming up in Sichuan two years ago saying that uh, parents of uh, uh, Christian parents uh, can no longer homeschool their kids. They have to send their kids to public school. And uh, uh, I have received from various local level news of a local authority forbidding church of conducting Sunday school. Uh, people have to be educated in, in public schools or church uh, forbidding members to, uh, uh, to uh, or, or, or local authority encouraging neighborhoods to report on each other on whether the church is meeting in their own neighborhoods. So yes, pressure is definitely ramping up across the spectrum. And there is no singular uh, across the broad uh, across the board persecution policy yet, like no no like a Diocletian level of persecution. Uh, but what we are seeing is that given the increasing concentration of power and the overbearing state, uh, previously uh, rare occurrences are occurring more frequently, and local authorities could get more uh, away with it. So uh, that that pressure is seeping in definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's good to get the contemporary context because I think that at least that's probably what when you hear about the church in China, this is kind of the thing mm -hmm. I think a lot of us probably had in mind or sort of wondering about that that kind of situation mm -hmm. that sort of rings bells. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to ask a question. Laurie Tischler, our friend Laurie Tischler has had a question on here for a long time, so I want to return to it. It connects to uh, a little bit more of your dissertation research, which has always been interesting to me because you've had to intersect these incredibly deep intellectual histories of both American and Chinese Christianity together. And so she was wanting maybe to have you explain a little bit more about what the connection to Calvinism was. Why, why did they see this as this sort of intellectual root? And, and I think even Republican in the lower case R sense of mm -hmm. the word, uh, much like the American Puritans did, mm -hmm. uh, kind of basis of Christianity. I mean, how does, is this all just missionaries that are making this happen or why, why, is, why is this happening? Yeah, well, it is missionaries, indigenous, indigenous searchers, and the Chinese uh, theologians only in one. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think if we are looking for the kind of a theological uh, cutting edge of Chinese Christianity, that cutting edge is very much squarely in the Calvinist tradition. And some of the leading theologians in Chinese church today um, uh, uh, have uh, got their degrees of studying uh, Herman Bavink or Abraham Kuyper or, uh, or, or, or Calvin himself or Heinrich Bullinger in various European or American universities. So, and, and many, including studying Machen and Hodge and Cornelius Van Til. Uh, as for why they were drawn to Calvinism, uh, so to uh, to make a very long and complex intellectual story very simple and short, um, they 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 believed that in the, uh, well because uh, uh, in the words of Stephen Tong, uh, a, a a very famous Calvinist uh, evangelist, uh, who, who once said uh, China had searched for democracy and republic lower our republicanism before. Um, in, in 1911, when uh, when the Republic of China overthrew the Qing Dynasty and built a republic, and 
then again in 1949 when the communist party established at least what what is nominally people's republic um and in 1989 uh, when chinese uh, pro uh, pro democracy activists want to establish a more uh, a more democratic republic um, and they all failed, and uh, none of them truly generated a long-lasting, meaningful republic. And his uh, answer for why they failed is that we uh, were missing an element, and that element was religion, and more particularly the religion of the Puritans and the Calvinists. And of course, he was being, as was with common with many Chinese Calvinists, they were being rather selective with uh, what the Calvinist tradition they they they, they inherit. Uh, the the most uh, often uh, the the most frequent source of inspiration uh, is Calvin him, uh, or Calvin himself, uh, the English Presbyterian movements uh, under Elizabeth and James, and the American Puritans, uh, the American Puritan settlers in Massachusetts. And I think we can see why, because in, in a sense, those Calvinists were facing a similar kind of situation than Chinese Christians today. Uh, the English Presbyterians, in a sense, were people who are arguing for um, a, 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 a more limited power for the monarchy and, the, a, and a more classical and republican form of government against uh, royal pressure from Elizabeth, and uh, which many Chinese Christians uh, thought they were doing the same thing. They were trying to argue for a, mo a, a, a more checked power on the state, uh, a, a, mo a more um, a republican form of a society against the persecution of the state. So they thought, um, and so they drew in a, lot, a lot of inspiration from from the Calvinists, especially on how uh, on whether there is a rationale for the church to resist the state, on whether there is a rationale for the church to gather uh, themselves without state approval, and there they were also inspired by uh, the, uh, the American Puritans who believe that the foundation of a church is the covenant of the believers who gather together. And they do not require the state and uh, the official state approval, um, so that it, we we can see how that was inspiring for the Chinese uh, Calvinists. It's so interesting because you know I think for a long I, we've talked about this, but for a long time it was sort of axiomatic in American historians too that like small R republicanism had this mm -hmm. uh, huge root in like the American Puritans and mm -hmm. and their uh, intellectual edifice for a polity that they're creating in the Commonwealth and Massachusetts mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see that same sort of conversation being litigated in, in a different context mm -hmm. um, about the sources of, of this kind of uh, um, polity. Um, I want to it, and it's impressive to see you darting around, by the way, back and forth from like English to American to Chinese history. So I'll answer this question is uh, it's very cosmopolitan. It's why it's quite fun. Um, I would like to pivot real quick to uh, uh, President Stephen Elmore to uh, come up here and give some announcements and we'll return to our last question real quick. Hi, Chris. Hi, Yu Chang. Thank you so much for uh, a fascinating snapshot of, of what's going on in China and, and the historical aspects as well. Um, I definitely learned a, a few things. Um, <clears throat> so tonight I'd like to uh, start by thanking our partners and volunteers for making this webinar possible. Through your generosity, uh, our webinars highlight our speakers who are living in the legacy of C.S. Lewis in higher education, ministry, and the arts uh, to bring faith, reason, and imagination uh, to the academic world and to the culture at large. If you'd like to uh, join those who have... Uh, so graciously and generously supported our webinar this evening um, or support the work of the foundation in general, uh, I invite you to go to www.cslewis.org. And if you'd like any more information on the foundation and what our mission is and what we do, if you're new to our community, uh, please feel free to email me at Stephen, and that's spelled with a V, at cslewis.org. Uh, just a, one big announcement that I have is uh, that early bird registration uh, ends tomorrow uh, evening. Uh, I think it's midnight Pacific time. So those on the East Coast get a little bit more time in the day. And uh, that's uh, for the C.S. Lewis retreat uh, that we're having in October uh, near Houston, Texas. Uh, if you register by tomorrow, you could save up to uh, $30 per person. And the dates for the conference, uh, for the retreat, I should say, are October 13th through 15th. The theme is Remember the Signs, Faith, Knowing, and the Real in the Silver Chair. Uh, this year is the 70th anniversary of the Silver Chair's publication, 
It's also the 125th anniversary of Lewis's birth and the 60th anniversary of his death. So a lot of uh, anniversaries this year that we're celebrating at the retreat. And uh, I've seen a few of you on that have registered already, uh, recognize the names. Um, so we welcome uh, the rest of you uh, to consider joining us. Should be a very special event uh, given the anniversaries and all the wonderful themes uh, that Lewis packed into the silver chair. It's one of my favorites. And uh, we'd love to have you with us. Um, that's all I have tonight. Um, we're planning future events for 2024. So please pray for us in that. And uh, I'm working through contracts uh, with a couple of venues uh, actually for next year uh, as we speak. So we look forward to uh, some many, many new announcements uh, in the, the coming months. All right, back to you, uh, Chris. All right, um, so we have time here for, I think, one more question that I'd kind of like to spin into your, your last word here. We had a comment from Lisa Baldwin, who actually has been to China and observed the underground church when she was there. And so I'd like to read uh, what she said, and then I think we can I think we can kind of ask a big picture question. But she says, when when I was in China, I observed the underground church seemed to work well. It seems that this is even more necessary now with what's going on currently. Um, I'm part of a home assembly now here in the States, and I much prefer it than church in a traditional building. I say this because the ability to be in a more intimate group where the gifts can operate, including the Holy Spirit, um, to move freely versus a more formatted program that does not do a restricted format. So I saw there and see here that the underground church and home assembly is a beautiful way for the body of Christ to follow Jesus. And she's curious, she has uh, there's continued questions about here about the relation between uh, these indigenous kinds of Christianity and the, and the uh, informal underground kind that is not very hierarchical versus the traditional format that maybe is like something like Lewis was familiar with, you know, in a highly organized hierarchical Anglican communion. And so I'm curious in, in your thoughts on, and maybe in response to her question, what are the things that we can learn both positively and negatively from these, both the underground church and the urban elite churches, those of us here today on the seminar who may be in a different context and what, what, what big takeaway you think would be important for us to learn? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, th th thank you for asking that, Lisa. Um, I'm <clears throat> uh, the underground form versus the, the above ground form that the debate between those is uh, uh, as old as uh, uh, the new generation of Chinese Christians itself. Um, and uh, uh, of course, nobody can deny the effectiveness and the beauty in the underground format. And um, that was, after all, the format that allowed the Chinese church to survive heavy uh, state persecution and uh, retained a certain vitality and even expanded uh, under severe political pressure when uh, the, when everyone thought that the religion had died out, that Christianity ha had died out. But of course, the newer generation uh, complained quite a lot about the underground form, uh, format. As I mentioned, they believe that, um, that uh, for those who are more socially and culturally ambitious, who are more politically ambitious, uh, they they find the underground church to be incapable of a truly become of truly serving the complex public functions that are required of uh, civil societies in our day and age. Um, and and here, um, many of the Chinese ur uh, urban elite Christians were inspired by the the, uh, the, 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 the trope, one might say, the image of a city on a hill. And uh, and they were inspired that not only from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, but also from the classic Puritan sermon, uh, where John Winf Winforock said that we are on a city on a city, city on a hill, and the eyes of all people are are, are upon us. And why were they in so inspired by that? Well, we might say part partly that is the Confucian literati mentality at work, but partly I think there is also something beautiful about it that they believe that the church and that the faith as vibrant as Christianity is, cannot simply be limited to the private sphere. It must bear public relevance. It must bear pub uh, it must have a public uh, uh, influence in a sense. And it's hard to be that sitting on a hill um, by hiding in, in people's homes secretly or, and underground. So I, what I'm seeing here is perhaps the public, the ambitious, the, uh, the, the, the socially conscious uh, aspect of Christianity conflicting with the free, the pietistic, and the private part of Christianity. And I think this faith must be vibrant in, 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 in both ways. Uh, both areas need, need to flourish. So um, part of uh, what we want to develop uh, 
uh, with a more mature public theology is how do we retain both sides? How do we retain both the beauty and the freedom in smaller, more free flow congregations and the public responsibility and the public consciousness in bigger, more above ground, more high profile congregations? And uh, uh, I think various theologians have attempted to do that. Um, uh, personally, I'm inspired by Abraham Kuyper and Duke's own Stanley Howell. Was, uh, uh, Duke's own Stanley Howell, was, I, I, I read his. Uh, community of character as his one of his attempts to combine those two things. Um, but yeah, I think um, we uh, people who are more leaning one way uh, must realize the beauty and, and the value in another way. And uh, perhaps somehow we can all join the process of thinking about how to bring out these uh, dual advantages of the uh, uh, dual aspects of the faith and bear truly great witness, both in private and in public. Well, there's a lot to think about <laughs> <laughs> in that comment and in all the whole presentation in this fascinating interplay mm -hmm. of both intellectual and spiritual um, reciprocity uh, mm -hmm. between American and Chinese Christianity here that you've been telling us about. And so, um, I would very much look forward to seeing um, more of your work come out and when you're, you're soon to be Dr. Bai and then we will uh, be able to read your dissertation when it is complete. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Well, thank, uh, you. thank you again um, for coming to speak with us. And uh, for those of you that are interested in uh, the uh, webinar discussion group, uh, Steve Nomore has just posted the uh, Zoom link in the chat. So please click on that to join us. And I would like to conclude real quick with a, um, maybe to bridge our informal, somewhat informal conversation with a more uh, liturgical, hierarchical kind of, of uh, religion. I have a set prayer to read from John Chrysostom about uh, on the conclusion of, of study. And so I will read that real quick um, before we conclude. Uh, so this uh, prayer, O Lord Jesus Christ, open the eyes of our heart, that we may hear your word and understand and do your will, for we are sojourners upon the earth. Hide not your commandments from us, but open our eyes, that we may perceive the wonders of your law. Speak unto us the hidden and secret things of your wisdom. On you do we set our hope, O my God, that you shall enlighten our minds and our understanding with the light of your knowledge, not only to cherish those things which are written, but to do them. For you are the enlightenment of those who lie in darkness. And from you comes every good deed and every gift. Amen. Mm -hmm.